yeah, it's nice to see everybody and know that everybody's here and I uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, yeah, and welcome to Mahamudra for the People. Uh, and, and this is a new, um, a new day, as it were, uh, because we finished um, the third Karmapas Mahamudra Aspiration Prayer uh, last week. And so we're moving on to a new text um, today. Uh, and I figured um, partially out of my own uh, kind of love for this collection of texts and then partially because I just learned uh, yesterday that um, one of my teachers, Gelsa Brampache, is going to be giving the transmission for all of the Indian you know, source texts for the Mahamudra tradition um, in March. <laughs> and I sadly won't be able to be there uh, in Sikkim to receive them. But I figured um, we might as well do some that I have received and, and we can share them, you know, together here. Um, so actually this, is, we're going to be focusing for the next couple of weeks on, or I'm sorry, yeah, the next couple of weeks probably, um, this Mahamudra text by the Mahasiddha Saraha which is included in a collection of dohas or these, these kind of, you know, tantric, you know, Mahamudra songs um, compiled by the 16th Karmapa into this one text of eight uh, uh, Mahamudra texts. Um, I think it collated at some point in Bhutan in the 1970s, from, if, if, I, if I understand correctly. So 16th Karmapa thought that these were a good, uh, you know, group of texts to put together, and and they are quite lovely. Um, and they, they they run the gamut, um, you know, by Saraha, Virupa, uh, you know, and others, but all, all you know, typically uh, early Indian um, masters of tradition. Um, I learned about this text. I I want to say in somewhere around 2013 and happened to receive the, the transmission for this from Ringo Toku. Um, at one point he was coming to Geltsburg J Center that I used to run in Brooklyn uh, and staying with us here. He was actually sitting right where I'm sitting now <laughs> when he gave it to me. Um, and uh, then I received it again from uh, His Eminence Geltsburg J um, a couple years after that. And uh, teachings on a number of these uh, songs. So, um, so that's a little bit of kind of background on uh, what this is. And I, I like to share that information just because it's um, kind of like knowing where the wine that you're drinking is coming from. Right? It's, it's a nice thing to have that kind of you know, uh, background knowledge um, that you're not all drinking bad wine <laughs> or shady wine. So, um, so, but I figured, you know, in order to get in the mood, <laughs> as it were, maybe we could do uh, a little 12 minute sit. Um, and so, um, again, we're maybe basing this a little bit on, um, you know, my memory of Third Karmapa's Mahamudra Aspiration Prayer, um, which I'm sure is quite shoddy and unreliable. Uh, I'll give a little bit of instruction. Um, so for these 12 minutes, allow yourself to um, rest your body. Right? So allow your body to be as relaxed as possible. But um, if you can be seated, that's great. But if you need to lay down, that's fine. Um, and I'm here in the Caroline of Brooklyn and people love to land their horns. And so just as much as I have to just, you know, learn how to let these things go, you know, as if they're self-liberated in the moment, try to allow yourself to let everything that arises, thought activity, sound, emotional response, uh, biological functioning, little aches and pains, if they come, try to let them just be naturally liberated of, of their own accord, right? So meaning letting them dissolve instantaneously as they arise. 
Just allow your breath to be natural. Allow your mind to be free, supple. Allow yourself to rest beyond any kind of preoccupation with time. Oh yeah, I can help with the headphones on just in case. Uh, I also tend to mumble. Don't tend to mumble every time I die. So. Allow yourself to rest beyond the three times, so beyond past, beyond future, beyond the present, beyond meaning free of them, beyond meaning they're not real, beyond meaning the time is always whatever it is. Allow yourself to let go of any kind of control of this moment. Try not to modulate or figure anything out and just rest.
and slowly bring yourself back. <clears throat> and so today we're going to um, intersperse some of the text with practice, text with practice, um, etc. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, I think I would like to begin with um, something interesting. I, I, um, but I don't know, it's interesting to me. I, um, I had this opportunity to meet a friend for lunch yesterday. They're a Dharma practitioner and uh, they teach a particular kind of um, practice. And we've known each other for, uh, I don't know how long, maybe... Um, nine years or so. Um, <clears throat> and what came up was, was a really fascinating um, difference between this person and I in terms of how we teach. And um, they were kind of towing this um, very like masculine, hardcore practice. You know, you gotta practice all the time, practice all the time, practice all the time. Um, and you need to be intense about it and intensive. And if you're not doing that, then you're not really practicing. And um, <laughs> and there's always a part of me that like has this really like um, intense desire to turn away from that kind of perspective, um, especially with respect to these kinds of practices of of mamu transaction and and. Um, they were talking to me about like, you know, how much shamatha they do. And they're like, I do all this shamatha and it's, it's hard and it's intense. And I just, you know, hours of it. And, you know, again, I, this person is a friend and I, um, <laughs> I find it hard sometimes to give them constructive criticism. That's hard to hear because I also don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if they want to hear it. So, you know, inside I'm just like, Oh, you know, just kind of letting everything filter through. Um, and so I, I, I think, you know, it's important for us to kind of understand um, how to relate to practice in a way that allows us to be able to keep this edge of ease, right? Because we're, we're, not, we're not fighting anything. We're not beating anything into a particular form. It's not like our mind is some kind of, you know, metal, like copper, that's being crafted into a particular shape. You know, you need different kinds of mallets and chisels and things like this, and you need to beat it and subjugate it and you know, really knock it about. Sometimes we may find ourselves with these obstacles that have involve a little bit of discipline, right? Self-discipline, perhaps. Um, and usually that's probably the main place where a little bit of forceful effort might be needed, right? When we're not wanting to practice or um, maybe we're feeling a little raw and it's easier to just get up or, or do something, engage in some kind of distraction. Well, then maybe then it's helpful to kind of, you know, apply uh, a little bit of, you know, modicum of pressure no, um, to ourselves. But as we'll see, like these, these practices are so subtle. They're so subtle that they get missed. They're so subtle it's hard to understand. You know, in Third Karmapa did a really beautiful job, um, you know, talking about how essentially this is right on the tip of our nose. You know, it's so subtle that not even Buddhas can really um, convey it well. Right? They can point us in the direction of our, our you know, ability to rest into our own mind, but it's really up to us to do this work of really letting go of concept. And I'm, I get a little concerned sometimes about these conceptual ideas and departures around forceful effort and the application of intense effort um, 
to an experience that's supposed to be beyond word, beyond concept, beyond work, even, right? even, even effort. Right? We really take a look at what simplicity means in the context of these practices, because the word simplicity is used. Right? How on God's green earth <laughs> can you beat simplicity into practice? Right. In fact, like, you know, I mean, the work is about getting loose, right? Ooh, letting go, getting out of ourselves, right? And getting out of our rigidity, out of our, you know, intensity. Um, and I would also venture to guess that everybody here, anybody watching this recording, will tend to equate their, these moments of intense samsara with a tightness of concept, a tightness of idea, a tightness of, you know, the way things are supposed to be kind of thing. Oh, it's not the way things are supposed to be. That's why this moment is bad. It's not the way things are supposed to be. That's not what this person's supposed to tell me. That's why I'm in a bad mood or, you know. So just something to think about, right, as, as we engage in these practices. Um, it's not particularly hard work, right? But, um, but how to be loose and easy, right? free and relaxed. Um, yeah, not getting too tight. While we were sitting, I was thinking, wow, there's so much traffic noise. It sounds like I'm in Varanasi or Delhi even. <laughs> You know, and then there's part of me that's like, oh, that's great. I love being in those places. <laughs> and I can rest into meditation there. Then I have to be able to rest into meditation here, right? Um, <clears throat> letting go of all the shoulds. You know, letting go of like, should, 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 should. So even, you know, with my friend who I care about very deeply and, Uh, you know, letting go is hard. And there's a certain element of um, maturity, I think, in our practice that is reflected in just letting go. Just for, who cares? <laughs> or as one of my teachers, you know, said, you know, shut up. Just who cares? not all worth commenting on, it's not all worth being intense about. Nature of mind is here before we're born, nature of mind is here after we die. There's nothing you really need to do. So I just want to share that. Of course, I don't want to tell anybody here to shut up. <laughs> Very not popular. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, so what I'm doing is, um, I'm just making sure I can see this text. Um, and so this uh, text is called, um, well, in, uh, so this is by uh, Saraha. Um, and in translation, it's called the Mahamudra Instructions entitled The Doha Treasure. Uh, in Sanskrit, it's, um, I need to make this a little bigger so I can actually see. Um, do, uh, okay. Doha Ganama Mahamudra Upadesha. Um, and uh, the text is divided into three parts. Um, the first is um, the Mahamudra's true nature. The second part is the practice of Mahamudra. And the third part is the liberation of Mahamudra. So we're going to focus on, on the first part um, today. Um, in the Mahasiddha Saraha, for, for those who are, are unaware, is often credited as being kind of one of the early human um, kind of progenitors, a person to have you know, received direct experience of, of Mahamudra and then transmitted it. Um, and 
Um, it, was, it was also particularly interesting, um, and, and it kind of depends a little bit on, on like what kind of biographical information you read about um, Saraha, but he, you know, he was said to be, you know, born into a Brahmin family. Uh, and depending on the text, some biographies say that, you know, he practiced, so some, some say he left his, his Brahmanism. Uh, others say that, you know, he was able to maintain this relationship to a uh, uh, Buddhist practice in which he would um, practice both, you know, and, and one of the easy ways in terms of narrative structure that they describe is, you know, during the day he would practice, you know, in the Hindu tradition, and at night he would practice in the Buddhist tradition. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily like that, you know, split, right? But, but I think the point is, um, he was able to hold both. Um, and what was also very interesting too, is that he um, had the spiritual partner um, uh, who uh, he met in a market, and she was an arrow maker, right? And, um, and in, in these biographies, you know, arises uh, as an emanation of uh, a Dikini, right? Uh, and her, he happens upon her in this marketplace and she's crafting arrows and she uses the, the description of making an arrow and shooting an arrow as, um, as a meditation instruction. And uh, he becomes quite enamored with her spiritual wisdom, and I'm sure with her, right? Because why, why else would you, you know, have a relationship with somebody, right? So there's this kind of really nice thing going on, and um, she's a particularly profound person. And uh, interestingly enough, we don't have any known, you know, it, anything of her other than what comes through these stories. Um, but it's clear that they support one another and, and uh, she supported him you know, in his practice. Uh, so just a, a little bit about him and then um, maybe later this year, um, I can give the transmission for a guru yoga of Suraha, which um, comes from the Shijie tradition that I received from uh, Lama Wangdu Rinpoche, uh, I don't remember when, but at some point in 2015 or so, uh, which is really nice, written by Taranatha. Uh, it's a really nice way of just having this personal relationship to Saraha. Saraha is somebody who I had a, a, like a dream about when I was seven years old. Um, I've always had this kind of very long connection uh, with him. So, so this begins with um, this opening, you know, I pay homage to Sri Vajudikini. And so basically, you know, paying homage to uh, Vajrayogini, essentially, this um, and Dikini principle, if we want to use kind of a Trungpa style way of describing it, right? But this uh, uh, embodiment of awakening that is, you know, takes the form of, you know, female form, of female energy. Um, and then he goes on to say, I pay homage to the innate wisdom of the Dharmakaya and great bliss. And so then he goes on to begin to explain the true nature of Mahamudra. And this initial part has three parts. Right? The first is the manner in which Mahamudra is present. And Sraha says that the animate and inanimate, the mobile and immobile, all things and nothing, all of appearance and emptiness itself, everything, everything without exception, throughout all time, never deviates from the nature of space. Absolutely everything never deviates from the nature of space itself. All thought, all appearance, the idea of emptiness itself, everything that moves, everything that has the ability to shift, 
everything that's completely fixed. Everything has the same nature, the nature of space. It's vast dynamism. Also, this lack of individual conceptual separateness. Everything has the same nature. This nature lacks any labels. He goes on to say that you can repeat the word space, 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 <laughs> space. But still, the essence of space has no reality whatsoever. It transcends being an object that can be said to exist. And it transcends being an object that can be said to not exist. To neither exist nor not exist. Or to be something other than that. Right? So it's kind of like painting the picture. So I don't know if anybody here has had, you know, a feeling of tightness over the past day or two, or <laughs> yes, yeah, right, or some kind of like uh, laundry list of things to do. It's kind of always my thing. And half of the list has to just get pushed to the next day, and then half of the list of the next day needs to get pushed to the next day. Right? All of that, in one way, isn't real. Right? All of this has the same nature long laundry list, the resistance to the laundry list, the anxiety about the laundry list, the worry about the laundry list, the good feeling of tearing up the laundry list, the bad feeling of having just torn up the laundry list. This is all the same. Every single thing has the same, the same nature. And that nature can't be said to exist or not exist. It's beyond that. So already we're moving away from this hard headed, very male, masculine way of practicing. You can't beat this into your own head. <laughs> you can't beat this into your own practice. You just need to stop. Stop being yourself. Stop being a disciplinarian. Stop being so smart. And stop comparing. So then he goes on to say, thus, there isn't the slightest difference between space, and mind, and the truth. These are just separate incidental terms. They're nothing but meaningless, false words. Blah, blah, blah. Same thing, who cares? Shut up. <laughs> Just let it go. Most of these objects that are inanimate, unless we destroy them, will outlive us. And why do we need to grasp? Why do we need to push away? Why do we need to hoard? There isn't the slightest difference between space and mind and truth. Just open up.
It continues by saying all phenomena are one's own mind. There is not even a particle of phenomenon that is other than mind. The one who realizes the primordial non-existence of mind attains the sacred realization of the victors of the three times. All phenomena are your mind. There is not even a particle of phenomenon that is other than your mind. The one who realizes the primordial non-existence of mind attains the sacred realization of the victors of the three times. Nothing to do. No hardness necessary. What I love about this too is Saraha comes from this mixed practice lineage, right? Theoretically half Buddhist, half Hindu, or half Hindu, half Buddhist, <laughs> depending on what you like, right? So far there's no terminology, oh, this is a Hindu thing or this is a Buddhist thing. Who cares? What's the big deal? So far, in the text, there's no mention of ambition or efforting. There's no mention of rigor and being an athlete, spiritual athlete. All phenomena are your own mind. There's not even a particle of phenomena that is other than your mind. What does this mean? So let's take a moment and pause right here. We're gonna sit for a slightly shorter period of time so that we can just taste, right? All we're doing is savoring. This is like an amuse-bouche of the nature of mind. Seven minutes. Say seven minutes is too long. Five minutes. Five minutes to just touch. But I'd like you to just keep something in your consciousness and don't use it as a tool. It's not a plow, it's not an ox, it's not a <laughs> cudgel. Right? All phenomena are your mind. There is not even a particle of phenomenon that is not. So this means no separation. This means no objectification. This means relaxing into letting everything be. This means no projecting anything onto anything, letting everything just be as it is, letting go. Let's let go together.
all phenomena are your mind. Visual, auditory, mental, emotional, Let everything occur, don't suppress, don't control. Slowly open your eyes. Before you do anything, try to hold all visual phenomena knowing that all phenomena is your mind. It is not even a particle phenomena. It's other than that. How can we feel offended? How can we feel that we need to take any of this in such a way that it activates us? And one of the most amazing things about this kind of experience I find is that we begin to kind of understand how um, enveloped we are by mind. It's like a big, I don't have an envelope here. It's like being in a sleeping bag of mind. Every thought that arises is of the same nature. Every emotion that arises is of the same nature. Every object in your home or apartment is of the same nature. Why muddy the water? Swaha says the one who realizes the primordial non-existence of mind attains the sacred realization of the victors of the three times. This is gentle wisdom. This is easy wisdom. This is not wisdom of scholars. 
not highbrow. It's not high caste. It's very basic. So Saraha goes on to say, it is perfectly named the casket of Dharma, right, this collection of Dharmas. It is not a Dharma that is anything other than the nature that is a primordially innate. Right? So even though you call it the casket of Dharma, all it is is primordial innate presence or being. It's all it is. So we can use flowery language. Oh, it's the great expanse of the blah, 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 unknown to, you know, great sinners and the stuff of pundits riding the wings of Gandharvas through the, the Trikaya realm, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But it's just primordially innate being. Here's the kicker. The truth is not something that can be taught. It cannot be described. So no one can understand it. This is where people are like, oh, so it is the stuff of pundits. <laughs> because how, how else? If it cannot be taught, if it cannot be described, if no one can understand it, well, then it must be, you know, very, very rare. So I says that to say it has a possessor, somebody who could possess it would be a mistake for how could there be a possessor in primordial primordial selflessness how could that be if the mind exists then all phenomena would exist if the mind does not exist who would realize the dharma that which appears as mind and phenomenon, if one seeks it, it will not be found. And there is no seeker anywhere. It is not non-existent. Throughout the three times, it is unborn and unceasing. Unborn and unceasing. unborn and unceasing. It does not become anything else. It's the ultimate state of great bliss. This restfulness and easefulness, a relaxedness. Therefore, all appearances are the Dharmakaya. All beings are Buddhas. All composite actions are the primordial Dharma Dhatu. All nominal phenomena are like a rabbit's horns. Nada. So this is our basic state. And I love that Saraha starts with this, you know, because we, you know, let's say we all died <laughs> and then get to, to the rest of it. Oh, well, that wouldn't really matter so much because this is the best part, right? There's nothing to do. 
This was so heartbreaking about my friend the other day. They had so much to do. And then they asked me, what are you going to do? I was like, I want nothing. <laughs> they looked a little disappointed. We were literally talking about all the things we're going to do. Oh, are you going to do this now that travels? You know, are you going to go, go back to in India and be like a sadhu? And uh, no. Like, oh, well, you have all these kids. Yep. Yeah. Don't you want to go do that? No. Nope. Why? Because it's here. India's here. Tibet's here. Outer space is here. Inner space is here. Hell is here. I mean, we're going to be totally honest, right? <laughs> Hell is right here. Heaven is right here. Everything in between is right here. Why, why does anyone need to go anywhere? Yeah, and this is what Saraha is saying. It's like, stop. Relax. Stop and relax and stop doing things other than being. Why are you so busy? Why are you constantly differentiating? It's also really lovely and, and important to, to kind of begin to explore attachment, aversion, and ignorance, you know, the three poisons, how basic that is, right? But when we sit in relationship to phenomenon, sound, visual phenomenon, you know, thought, emotion, expectation, hopelessness, and every kind of possible thing that arises. Sadness, heartbreak, bitter, sweetness. As long as attachment and aversion are causing this push pull, push pull, push pull, right? Then we are squished and crushed and destroyed and reborn and squished and crushed and destroyed and reborn over and over and over again thousands of times a day and when we read some of these stories of the hell realms uh there are these great ones of like you know there's one where you climb a mountain and you get to the top and then slide down and it turns into like a grater and it just grates it shreds you you know and then you come back to, you know, a solid form again, then you walk back up and then you slide down the other one graded, you know, being shredded. And we do this all the time, right? We should, we get shredded every day over and over and over again. You know, and I'm going to get this wrong. So I'm sure somebody can chime in and correct me, but when they, is that um, phrase like, you know, what is the definition of insanity? And it's, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different outcome. Right, and this is, <laughs> this, is, this is our problem, right? Every day we wake up, oh, today is gonna be different. And then, you know, attachment, aversion, and ignorance set in, and oh, oh my God, <laughs> maybe tomorrow will be better. Because <laughs> I just, I fell right back into it, or I stepped back into it, or you know, whatever. All appearances are the Dharmakaya. All beings are Buddha, including you. Including you. All composite actions are the primordial Dharma Dhatu. So then goes into the next portion, which is beings are deluded because they have not realized the truth of Mahamudra. And here's the bad news. This is the part where we start to feel really bad about ourselves. Alas, although the cloudless sun's light rays are all pervading, darkness appears constantly to the blind. Although the innate is all pervading, the ignorant are very far from it. 
And so we're unable to see this clarity and the simplicity. We're unable to see our Buddha nature. <laughs> we're definitely unable to see it in others. Uh-uh, not you, not Ekta. <laughs> or Eric, or Richard, or Leah, or Marianne. Not them. You know. <laughs> We're not able to rest into this experience of letting everything arise freely, unimpededly, unobstructedly, in a way that's already complete. Nothing needs to be added, nothing needs to be taken away, nothing needs to be transformed. because beings have not realized the non-existence of mind, their analyzing mind binds it, constantly looking, searching, labeling, looking, where is it, where is it? Why not today? Why not yesterday? Must be tomorrow, three times. What comes next? What comes next? What comes next? What's gonna happen? What did happen? Oh my God, this happened, that happened. It's beginning to sound like a Dr. Seuss what does it mean? What does it mean? What does this life mean? That person's not in my life anymore. What does it mean? Oh, this person entered into my life. What does it mean? Oh, the sunrise is red today. What does it mean? It's really cloudy. What does it mean? I feel sad. What does it mean? I'm sick, what does it mean? I hear sound, what does it mean? Constantly analyzing, binding, putting ourselves in these boxes, feeling tight. I happen to be a triple Aquarius. I hate <laughs> this kind of stuff. I need to be free. What's this mean? Just as the insane are possessed by demons and powerlessly experience meaningless suffering, beings possessed by the great demon of conceptualization and belief in reality create nothing but meaningless suffering. This one's real unpleasant for some people. I'm going to repeat it. Just as the insane are possessed by demons, well, we know that's not, that's changed a little bit since you know, seventh century. And powerlessly experience meaningless suffering, beings possessed by the great demon of conceptualization and belief in reality create nothing but meaningless suffering. Everything, you know, the way we need everything to be a particular way. Needing everything to be clean and neat and nice and equal. And needing. Actually, this is interesting too. You know, talking to my friend, they were like, if we just gather all of these lineages, to, like, you know, gather, gather, gather these baskets, lineage teachings, all of them, let's do it all then we'll authentically have the meaning. And I, <laughs> I said, well, if you trust into your practice, you'll realize the innate, then who cares? <laughs> you know, who cares about collecting all of them through one, you realize all. No, 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 no. You have to collect all of them. If you collect them all, then you'll realize the one. Well, how old are you? How long is that going to take? I may have brought this up recently, but a, f a different friend of mine, uh, who's, who's a great scholar, was telling me um, that they just unearthed maybe, I don't know, within the past five years, 
a couple, like a hidden library of texts that were confiscated at the time of the fifth Dalai Lama. Most of them are kaju, various kaju texts, so karma kaju and trikun kaju and jukpa kaju. Um, and most of them they thought were lost until about, you know, the past five years and, and people have been going through them, through this collection. And there are all of these things people didn't know about, haven't known about for centuries. And the uh, a number of lineage transmissions that people assumed had had uh, had died because there's no no text available, and they've been found. And the interesting thing is that you know we can collect to all of these collect 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 and you know when we stop to think that like something like five or six percent of the Tibetan canon has been translated right, into into foreign languages, right? Um, the hubris of thinking we can know everything, the hubris of thinking we can collect it all. And it's not to say, oh, because it's been untranslated, let's not bother, right? I'm not saying that. But <clears throat> the one thing that's very evident to me, at least in the Dharma, is that every little instruction can completely liberate. And once we begin to understand that for ourselves, then there really isn't a huge point in chasing after absolutely every single lineage teaching, a Mahamudra, for example. All we need is this. We don't even need necessarily this whole thing. We just needed that first part. You know? We just need a direct introduction to the nature of our mind and the ability to keep coming back to that. And um, stabilizing and gently nurturing that process. We don't need a thousand things. What I really love about this collection of, of Dawes, right, is that there are eight of them. But then, you know, uh, and it takes what? I don't know how long it takes to get the reading transmission for this, but it doesn't take five weeks, four weeks, three weeks. It's just, you know, a couple things. So it's important for us to really kind of, especially this one point, that beings possessed by the great demon of conceptualization and belief in reality create nothing but meaning, meaningless suffering. It should have been me. Could have been me. I could have been a contender. Instead, it's Ekta. Sorry, Ekta, you're the, you're the one person I can see. Like, I'm gonna pick on you. It's gonna be Ekta. Why is it Ekta? It should be me. No, it should be somebody else. So it goes on to say, there are some ignorant who bind themselves with intellectual classifications. It's like looking, looking, looking. You know, like my friend who's going to wander. He's telling me about somebody we know together. They've dedicated the next 10 years of their lives to wander and find these things. And Saraha says right here, they leave the master at home and seek them elsewhere. Right? This is like, it's right here. Don't look over there. It's right here. You won't find it in this book. It's right here. You don't need this other book. It's not on your iPad. It's not in India. It's not in Sikkim, Bhutan, Tibet, Nepal, wherever. Some believe <laughs> reflections to be real objects. Some ignore the root and cut the leaves. Whatever they do, they're not aware that they're deceived. Searching, searching, searching. And so he goes on. Hey ho. Actually, this, let me just make sure I have this 100% correct. 
Yeah. It's the third part of this first part. Hey ho, even though these infants don't know the truth, I understand that they are never apart from the truth. I know my beginning and my end. I have seen it myself. I alone am left. I look at that aloneness and I see nothing. As there is no seer or seen, it is indescribable. As it is undescribable, who can understand it? Shut up. Let it go. Hey ho. Even though these infants don't know the truth, I understand that they are never apart from the truth. Looking elsewhere. What's in that room in the library? Stacks of books. Oh my God, these have been lost for 500 years. Confiscated. The answer's gotta be in there. Can't be right here in me. Can't be in my ears, my auditory consciousness. Can't be in my relationship to visual consciousness. Can't be in relationship to the way thought activity arises or doesn't can't be in relationship to emotional experience. Can't be in relationship to 2023. It has to be old. Can't be now. I know my beginning and my end. What does that mean? Your beginning and your end. I've seen myself. I alone am left. I look at that aloneness and I see nothing. As there is no seer or seen, it is indescribable. As it is indescribable, who can understand it? Where is the person? What is being understood? Who cares? <laughs> Again, who cares? When the natural mind is purified, one will enter into my realization. But remember, a lion's milk is not for an ordinary bad bowl. Right? This is lion's milk we're trying to drink. Right? So let's not put it in a bad bowl. Let's not put let's not misunderstand it. Just as in the forest, a lion's roar terrifies all of the weak animals while the lion's cubs joyfully run towards it. Teaching this primordially unborn great bliss terrifies the ignorant and mistaken, but raises goosebumps on the worthy. So hopefully you have some goosebumps. Yeah. So, so this is where we're going to pause. Where we're going to pause. Um, I want to see if anybody had any questions. or anxieties, or rage. Anyone really angry with me? Terrified. Oh no, what does this mean? I can't be such a jerk all the time. <laughs> oh yeah, Richard. Oh, I think you're muted. Or maybe I can work my magic. Here we go. <clears throat> Thank you very much. That was that was wonderful, and it's it's kind of, in some ways, bizarre to be asking this question, um, because you know who cares? But a number of us here in New Zealand do care, and we have a problem we'd like to ask your advice on, um, and that is, could you? Briefly talk about Samaya for us, please. What it what it means? There's so many ways that it is, um, you know, articulated and can create a great deal of anxiety 
and trepidation in my experience among um, Vajrayana students. And it would be very helpful to have your take on it. Yeah, okay. So, uh, this is interesting because like uh, you point out, there are a lot of different ways of reading this. Um, so some people, they'll say that Samaya is um, this relationship that one enters into with a teacher specifically within the context of, you know, Buddhist Tantra or Vajrayana Buddhism, in which the student is always, um, well, where the, in which the teacher becomes the master and the student can never question the teacher. Right? And um, I think this is, you know, this is a pretty common view, um, that particular view. I, I tend to take a much more dynamic approach to this. Um, depending on the nature of the cause of the Samaya relationship, whether it's an empowerment or, you know, an initiation, um, or even, you know, somebody pointing out the nature of mind, right? Because there is a smile like quality to that, even though it's not necessarily explicitly named under those, uh, smiles aren't necessarily described under those circumstances. Um, the way I understand these things and my root teacher kind of did this with me, um, she had given a couple of empowerments uh, early on when I first met her. And before I left uh, Sikkim at that time, she had a butter lamp, like a big butter lamp, and she made one for myself and one for my Dharma brother. And she asked us to light ours off of hers. You know, and she's like, this symbolizes our relationship. Right? Like, you're lighting your Dharma flame from mine and I expect you to take good care of it so that when I come back around I can light mine off of yours you know in this kind of nice um, symbiotic relationship is created um, I think Doubt is terrifying to people, and doubt is terrifying to people in the tradition, including a lot of Dharma teachers, right? So in very traditional Dharma settings, you know, very orthodox Dharma settings, I think a lot of teachers, lineage holders, are very uncomfortable slash scared when students doubt them or doubt the Dharma. And I think under those circumstances, these ideas of Samaya become a little perverted and are used as a way of quelling authentic intellectual curiosity, you know, and the critical voice of students. And that's not what the function of Samaya is supposed to be. The function of Samaya is supposed to be um, a, way, a Dharma practice in and of itself. When you look at the root Samayas, you know, tantric root Samayas, the only thing they're really pointing out is how to be able to hold your mind in relationship to Vajrayana Dharma, right? Don't cause, um, so even these ideas of like, don't cause a schism in the Sangha, right? This, these days, this has been kind of taken in a lot of Sanghas as, uh, to be a way to kind of control what is said or th thought or you know, don't question things. It's not like that, right? But that's what it becomes. Um, I believe that the root of that samaya is basically don't, you know, don't intentionally create harmful situations for your Vajra sisters and brothers, right? It doesn't mean don't question things. It doesn't mean don't be curious. It doesn't mean don't be critical. Right? But don't cause harm. Um, obviously not uh, mistreating women 
is a root samaya that gets violated all the time, you know, in contemporary Vajrayana sanghas, right? So there are a lot of female identified people here who have had that experience or seen that happen or heard of that happening. It doesn't take <laughs> that much <coughs> searching online to find some notable cases as of late, you know, let alone this kind of long thread about don't destroy the faith of another is a good one, right? And this, this, this one cuts both ways, right? There's, that could mean, you know, shut up and stop questioning, right? But that could also mean, um, what are your lineage holders doing? Right? You're destroying my faith. Um, not sharing Dharma secrets with people who are um, not prepared or suitable. Right? This has a lot to do with Fadriana's uh, little uh, intense because there's so many different views and some of the views converge even this this you know song up to this point can you know easily be taken as some kind of nihilistic thing where it's like oh man like you know, I don't need to do shit like I do not need to do anything I am my, I am my own master right um so that's not the best thing to, this song isn't the best thing to give to somebody who's really like, you know, uh, egocentric and green in their practice, right? This is the kind of thing that might lead them astray, not in the sense that they'll become like an evil wizard, but that they'll use something like this to, to kind of justify even worse behavior, right? So, Anyway, all of this is to say that a lot of the, this, you know, samayas can cut both ways in and of themselves. If you take some time to read them, and I'm, I know that you and, and the folks in New Zealand are, are incredibly experienced in Dharma, you can see that what the function of these is, is it's like a form of mind training, really. But for everybody, for the lineage holders themselves, too. You know, they, nowhere does it say, there's no like, um, you know, small print underneath like an asterisk with, you know, a disclaimer. Like, you know, these samayas are applicable only to practitioners X, Y, and Z who just received this empowerment and nobody else. Right? These samayas are, are also meant to be kept by the senior lineage holders. Right. And, and this is where there is, uh, you know, a, a huge contradiction, if not hypocrisy, where, you know, they'll often Samaya will be used as a cudgel in a way to kind of keep people uh, from questioning, from bringing, you know, authentic, natural human questions, if not about ethics, which typically, you know, Everybody tries to shut down these questions about ethics. But then, you know, efficacy in the way Dharma is transmitted these days, right? Maybe, you know, ideas of innovation. Oh, don't innovate. You know, that's a violation of Samaya. <laughs> yeah. Even bringing that up is a violation of Samaya. Um, you know, don't talk about, you know, sexual abuse. That's a violation of Samaya. Don't criticize somebody who has, uh, you know, uh, abused someone if they're a teacher because that's a violation of samaya. Um, so I think the other thing that's important too is is there's no and even here like look at Saraha. Um, you know nowhere does Saraha say anything about Basically, he says, you know, all of the conceptual reification, all of this, you know, addiction to things needing to be a particular way. Even I would, I would venture to guess he would say all religious systems potentially run us into the ground, cause endless suffering. 
the only thing that is essentially important is liberating our experience of mind in this moment. And under those circumstances, when samayas are used to control, are used to cause harm, to cause discord, they, they kind of become um, obsolete. They lose their, um, they lose, you know, they lose a lot of their valence, you know, their gravity. Yeah. What do you think? Well, yeah, I, I agree with, with everything you've said. It's very helpful. Thank you. I mean, the feeling that I've been having lately is that it creates a sense of dependence, which can become infantilizing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and uh, it gets a little bit hard to swallow at 70, <laughs> um, being treated like a three-year-old. Yeah. And 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 the and why I say that is that there's a sense of implicit threat that if you don't go along with narratives which sometimes are you know hundreds of years old and, and counter to current cultural understandings, you really don't get the picture and you're in breach if you question it. And it's very hard to have a kind of adult um you know conversation among the sangha when there's this kind of fear of breach uh hanging like a cloud over the discussion does that mm -hmm. that make sense oh yeah. it totally does yeah. yeah i mean i guess my question would be like can you all be like saraha and say <sighs> i mean like <laughs> What is one in breach of, and who is the arbiter of justice in this situation? Where is this, right? What is the Samaya? Where is the Samaya? You know, uh, you know, the it's interesting because you know, it's like having given, given empowerments for which there are Samayas, there's you never see language. It's like, well, failure to adhere to the Samaya means that protector so-and-so is going to eat you. And of course, you know, we find in protector texts, there are these, you know, lines like, please, you know, punish <laughs> Samaya breakers and stuff like that. Anybody yeah. who's ever done Maha, you know, Maha Klik Bernachan or even Paul the Mama, like, you know, the language is in there. But I mean, there's a big difference between, in my mind at least, like, I mean, personally, <laughs> like I kind of enjoy those lines because it's just so medieval that I, I you know, it, I get a little excited like an actor being like, oh yeah, you know, go destroy them, you know, but for me, like, you know, I would be asking protectors to subjugate those who are making use of dharma for their own ends you know to kind of quote Jimi hendrix like talking about uh you know you know at one point in an interview he was talking about um like i don't have golden underwear or sleep on fat mattresses right it's like this whole thing of like you know these people who profit off of dharma right who live in um great comfort, have their students doing all this stuff for free, um, you know, who are not accepting responsibility for their position. Um, well, maybe they're violating Samaya. You know, those people who feel like they, um, you know, feel like they can have the right to make use of other people's bodies. Well, maybe the protectors should come down you know, and show them a little something, you know. So I think the other thing is, is like, there has always been, if, if, if in the time of the Dalai Lama, and this, this whole thing about this room full of texts that I'm talking about is true, if in the time of the fifth Dalai Lama, you know, the Desi or the regent of the fifth Dalai Lama was so angry that he was practicing Dzogchen, 
and other things that they had to go destroy monasteries and gather all their texts and squirrel them away for hundreds of years. Well then, you know, that is a form of intellectual argument, like a very strong one, right? There is a long thread of intellectual argument existing within the context of Vajrayana, right? Like the, the kajus, poor kajus. I mean, we, we got it super hard. We got it from the sakyas, get it from the geluks, we get it every which way. You know, the only, the only, you know, useful, we even get it from the Janangpa and then, which is ironic, um, cause they're like the whipping boys of the, uh, you know, of the Vajrayana tradition. You know, our longest standing uh, allies have been the Nyingma with a lot of this stuff. Um, so it's, it, it would be ironic and out of the um, ahistorical to say that you know intellectual difference is not welcome you know it's been it's been it's been you know i mean people in tibet have been debating about dharma since the tibetan language written language has been created right what is the true dharma what is the right translation what are the right terms etc you know um so anyway you know this is just stuff to think about i think that people should feel totally comfortable to you know, bring their own ethical values and that which is important to them to these sanghas where um, there is more than a mod modicum of control being kind of um, forced on people. A tremendous amount of control is being forced onto people and a tremendous amount of spiritual pain is being created as a result of that. I was upstate um, over New Year's. Um, I don't know, maybe like a 25 minute drive from KTV and I was talking with my wife about us going for a hike somewhere. And then I realized that there was a hike right by there that was really nice that I've never done. And I was like, oh man, that sucks because I've kind of made a personal vow to never go there because I just can't accept um, the harm that has been done um, spiritually uh, by that organization. And so I was like, oh shit, we're gonna need to find some other place to go hiking, <laughs> you know? Um, draw the line in the sand, you know? And who better to have in your court than Saraha? Because even, you know, just, Going back to the, the beginning portion of this song, right? The whole point, in fact, like I'm, I'll just go back. I mean, you know, like at, at what point do we need to somehow not hear this? Um, Just as the insane are possessed by demons and powerlessly experience meaningless suffering, beings possessed by the great demon of conceptualization and belief in reality create nothing but meaningless suffering. There are some ignorant who bind themselves with intellectual classifications. They leave the master at home and seek them elsewhere. In this point in particular they leave the master at home that's richard that's sam you know that's Aaliyah, that's ekta that's melissa that's gail and jan that's casey that's gendon that's bruce we leave ourselves out of the equation looking for the answer elsewhere the answer is in your practice the answer is in your experience of mind your experience of mind is no different than the mind of all the karmapas, you know, going back, you know, to the first karmapa. Your experience of mind is no different than Saraha's mind, Shavaripa's mind, Maitrepa's mind, you know, this lineage of Mahamudra. Your mind is no different than Marpa Lotsawa, no different than Milarepa, no different than Lama Shang. No different than any of the Buddhas. Right? Why do we have to look away? 
you know, this dependency. I mean, you know, the tradition, I truly feel this. I think we're at this point where the tradition realizes that without us being made dependent on them, they will not exist. And this is what I was telling my friend, actually. You know, they were like, we need to collect it all and then ask permission for, you know, to disseminate it. And I was like, hey, you know, you can do that. Permission, permission asking. I'm going to collect it all and do whatever I want with it. <laughs> Why? Not because I'm a jerk and not because I'm trying to create an empire, but because um, it's not about that, right? Like, it's not about that at all. Um, there's just so much fear these days and I think there's a lot of fear within the, the, the hearts of a lot of people related to the lineages themselves who recognize that their comfort and their power is not only is it waning, but that the, the needs, these like postmodern needs these days are really requesting things to show up differently and language to be different, style to be different, you know. Um, and you find a lot of Dharma practitioners who in, in, you know, out of fear will back these real kind of, you know, orthodox views because they're afraid of being different. You know, this is, this is my ultimate kind of like learning about my friend from lunch the other day is they don't have the uh, strength to really be who they want to be. Instead, they, they'll tow a much more uh, harmful line so that they can be safe. I've seen this, you know, I mean, no better place to see this than, than on social media, but I've seen this play out, you know, in, in person too, you know, here and in Asia, right, where people will attack and tear down people in sanghas. Um, so that they can be like a Dharma warrior and maybe be thought of positively by the lineage holder who sees, ah, this person is a warrior for Dharma. You know, but all they are are the same kind of you know, intolerant person as the intolerant Christians or intolerant Muslims or intolerant Hindus that we find in other parts of the world. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, just because we hide doesn't make it right, right? That just because people hide from the impact of us, they can turn away, they can ignore us, they can, you know, not be on social media so they don't hear or see how they're being tagged in these responses, you know? But I, but I do, like, from what I do understand from people I know behind the scenes. Um, there's a great awareness. And I was also talking to my friend about this. I was like, you know, like, you know, I first, you know, went out to, to Asia in 1995 and, you know, connected to, to Dharma there. And there were still these, you know, at that time, there's still people alive who were great masters of the pre-diaspora uh, um, aspect of the of the tradition, and now, given the fact that it's 2023, there's basically nobody. Maybe Lama Wangdu, you know, people of that age group in their 80s, you know, um, Temple Sultan Gamso, perhaps, who are of that era. Things have changed quite a bit. What you see in Asia has changed quite a bit what people have access to in India now, for example, in Nepal is so much different, right? Nobody had a phone, nobody had a TV in the room, no monks, but now all these monks have TVs in their rooms, 
you know, a lot of monasteries have parking lots. I'm serious. Like, you know, and, and you know, with all these senior lamas with their, their cars, you know, it's totally changed. Um, so I think, you know, those who are trying to hold on to the good old days have no idea <laughs> just like how gone those good old days are and, you know, not replicable. And we're just in a new time. The question is, though, is, is for groups like yours, you know, what kind of terms do you want to bring to this kind of relationship? I feel like I can have uncomfortable conversations with my teachers or maybe I feel like I'm always having them and showing up the way I want to show up even when they're like oh well, that person seems bossy or whatever but I mean I, in one level I find that they prefer that because it's clear I know what I want I'm generally showing up for what I want like, oh well we know what he wants this is easy you know <laughs> Um, maybe it's time to start saying what is needed rather than asking people permission uh, so that they can then tell them what it is they need to do. You know, like a revolt. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah. Like Thank maybe, you so much. I would say get some pitchforks and some torches and storm the castle. <laughs> I mean, you know, sometimes that needs to happen. Like, you know, I've seen that play out. I've seen that happen, you know, in, in, in uh, at Room Tech once. Um, I think the other thing I learned about myself, you know, in <laughs> like immensely painful lunch yesterday, apparently, was how much I, I can't stand, um, or I don't, it's not that I can't stand, but I'm not interested in uh, the propagation of a religion. I, I'm interested in the inspiration of people to be able to liberate themselves. Right? And that, like, uh, that's the only thing that really matters anyway. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. th there's no you guys are not serfs, you know, working the land, you know, providing the fat of the earth for these groups. And if you are, well then, maybe you guys should all become sadhus, you know, and see how they, you know, react. I mean, you have enough to be a sadhu in terms of all, everything I know of your practice history, like, you got the teachings, you got the, you know, the instructions, you have the clear, you know, uh, vision. Who cares what they think? They've got other things to worry about. <laughs> yeah. I know. We got to get this retreat thing together. We're raising goats and sitting in the dark together. <laughs> and that was wonderful. Thanks, Justin. Yeah, really thank you, Richard. It. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, the... So, the, you know, real briefly, I mean, this is why I like these kinds of songs, right? Like this era of Mahamudra, like this early Mahamudra is like the early Dzogchen texts. They're, they're quick. They're not institutionalized. They don't propagate systems other than, oh, just experience. And don't go to the temples. Don't go be a religious fanatic, right? It's right here. And these are, this is the kind of dharma I think that's much more useful now, you know, than other aspects. And, you know, again, like, I, I don't mean to sound disrespectful to the tradition. Um, 
because I want to be careful about not sounding parochial, but like I will make the argument that I think that this fear of critical analysis means that these conversations around uh, how religious organizations or religious aspects, well, religious organization, period, as an activity, often flies in the face of the Dharma itself. You know, I think this is what Trungpa and um, Kempo Gangshar, or maybe it was Kempo Gangshar who, you know, from my understanding of their relationship, it was Kempo Gangshar who pointed that out to Trungpa. It's just like, you know, you look at these places, like, you know, these big, you know, monasteries, the sizes of cities, you know, where there's like, you know, the rural community are, are all nomads. And you have these monasteries of 20,000 people. I mean, you know, uh, Drepung uh, and Sarah, they were, they were cities, like 20,000 people. And, and you have to remember that there were not huge cities like that, except for perhaps Lhasa, you know, and Shigatse. But even then, you know, there were these, you know, religiously curated and organized, you know, urban centers primarily made of the monasteries and the monasteries would all would all revolt against one another there were all sorts of you know uh, riots between you know uh, and even the Patala and Sarah and Jaipur know, there's constant fighting so this this clean narrative has never been there you know um, and again, you know, typically those in power thrive when those without the power don't question, right? When they're silenced. And we're talking about getting enlightened. We're not talking about propagating some kind of, you know, surf system. So if, if you want to get enlightened, you have to pick, you know, how you <laughs> to what extent you won't be subjugated like i mean we're already doing that to ourselves every day every day we don't need an extra thing like that and i think it's okay to say that look i don't need <laughs> this and if you need this if you need me to show up in this way well then you know maybe i don't need you you know and then if fear or, or trepidation or anxiety creeps in, then I would look directly into that and try to understand whether or not that's separate from your own awakened mind. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, the clean narrative, yeah, is the baby. Yeah, well, the medieval culture is the, is the, the bathwater. Yeah. You know, I mean, what do we want and when do we want it? Like, that has to be part of the question, too. Like, if you want liberation and the organized religion is getting in the way, step outside. I mean, the Buddha did that. Countless great lineage holders, male and female, did that. Where they're like, I'm going to stay away from this. That yeah. is a, there, that's a pit of vipers. I'm going to stay away. That's very empowering. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I'll say one last thing because I'm full of slogans. Vote with your feet. Just vote with your feet. You know, meaning if it's not working for you, leave. You know, you're not doing anything wrong. I think the only way we do things wrong, and even then, I don't even like to say it, but like about doing things wrong, because there's technically no wrong, 
but the 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 main way we can harm ourselves in this is if we just say oh yeah well this is pissing me off so much i'm gonna stop practicing period right that is that's that's the more dangerous thing and so if we get put pushed to that point then i think that in and of itself becomes a reason why a break should be taken from teachers who you know uh, require that quote-unquote pure samaya. If this is pushing us to a point of like, you know what, I, I'm giving up on this, right? Um, then that's the greater violence to self and other. Then uh, it's very uh, sorry. Right? That's yeah. I mean, that's very pertinent because just yesterday I heard that that was what one sangha member saw as their only option was to leave altogether yeah and 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 by that i mean give up buddhism mm -hmm. yeah right yeah okay yeah I well thank you everybody no, yeah i appreciate it i mean I, I i i wanted to go over just because uh this is a really important you know issue um and I'm glad we recorded it <laughs> too, because then now I'm going to be excommunicated next week. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Even if I were, I wouldn't care. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, again, just like keep Saraha in your heart. Like keep even, you know, Rangjung Dorje in your heart. Keep Lonchampa in your heart. Keep Samantha Bhadra in your heart. You know, keep this non-dual wisdom in your heart. That's the only thing that matters. The rest of it is human creation. You know? So take very good care of yourselves. <laughs> yes, and Bumi is for all the lost toys, excommunicated and otherwise. So may we just take a moment to dedicate the merit to all of the lost toys, and to all of the excommunicated people, to all, everybody who feels like a wanderer or a vagrant or a miscreant in the world of dharma may all of these people be the ones who are able to recognize the nature of mind and help steer the ship into the direction that allows for maximal liberation for all beings take very good care of yourselves be well and I'll see you all next week. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Eric. Thank you all. Bye-bye.